If we were hoping for the unsealing to reveal earth shattering new revelations that would undermine the foundations of the verdicts, I'm afraid what we got was kind of a nothing burger. So first off, I want to thank all of you for your patience in <laughs> waiting for this video to come out. Uh, I have read through all of the unsealed documents, not once, but twice. And so it's taken a bit of time to not only just get through everything and see what's there, but also to digest it a little bit before I came to you with my thoughts about what we learned from this process. So I want to start by pointing out that the goal of the unsealing here is transparency. And the reason why transparency is so valuable is because it lets us evaluate the outcome that we got from this trial to, to see what the process was that led to this verdict and evaluate whether there is anything here that calls the fairness of the process or the outcome into question. We saw in the days following the verdict, substantial efforts being undertaken by Amber Heard and her team to call that into question by suggesting there was information that wasn't allowed to be presented and that had it been, perhaps the outcome would have been different. And so the main thing that we see from this unsealing is that substantively, in terms of anything there that really shakes the, the foundations, that undermines the conclusions that the, the jury reached unanimously in light of all of the evidence that they saw over the six weeks of trial, there is nothing here that indicates in any way that the jury's outcome would have been different uh, had some of these rulings gone the other way. So from the standpoint of, is there anything here that suggests the outcome is going to be different on appeal? The answer to that is a solid no. The place to look for this by and large is the motions in limine that were filed. Uh, the motions in limine are where the parties are asking to essentially exclude, limit, um, alter, how the evidence is presented in the course of the trial. And so this is where we would expect to see the arguments over things like, for example, these therapist notes that Amber was waving about in that Dateline interview, uh, because had those been proffered and excluded before trial, we would have seen that uh, in, in a motion in limine. But we didn't see those things. And furthermore, to the extent that Amber wants to argue on appeal, it was error to not allow me to present these therapist notes to the jury, then those therapist notes need to be in the record. The Court of Appeals is going to need to see what is it that you wanted to present because their role is going to be to evaluate not only was it correct that these were not allowed to be entered, that you offered them and were denied that opportunity. But also, what would the impact have been on the trial had you, in fact, been able to present these documents? And so without those therapist notes in the record, there's simply no way for them to evaluate what the impact would have been. So that's why I would expect to see things like that in the record, in these motions in limine, in these unsealed documents, if those are going to be arguments that are actually presented on appeal and not just used for PR purposes in these friendly, non-challenging interviews where hard questions about them are not going to be asked. So from a standpoint of evaluating was the trial fair, there really are two questions that are presented by these unsealed documents. Was it fair substantively and was it fair procedurally? 
So, as I've said, substantively, we didn't really get any big new revelations in these documents. There simply are no smoking guns, there's no hidden proof that Johnny perpetrated abuse, uh, there's no excluded evidence of injuries on Amber that line up with the types of reports that she was making. And so instead, what we really got a look at in this process is the procedure itself, the litigation, how that unfolds, how the sausage is made, and how that leads to the types of decisions that were made about what to admit and what to exclude. So let's look at some of the substantive complaints that Amber and Elaine made in the days following the verdict, their explanations for why they thought this verdict was unfair. So first we have the decision not to allow the UK judgment into evidence. So the unsealing has shown us the arguments for and against presenting that judgment to the jury. Now we know from what we saw unfold in the trial uh, that ultimately it was Ben Chu's reasoning that prevailed here. And his point is simply that because this judgment doesn't have legal significance in the trial, it is not precluding the trial, it is not substituting for the jury's verdict, then it is ultimately just one guy's opinion. I, I love this reasoning because it's just the most America thing ever, right? In Thomas Jefferson's Virginia, uh, the UK judge, he's just some dude with an opinion. And to the extent that that opinion is purporting to substitute for the independent review and evaluation of the evidence that this jury engaged in, it's really not helpful. It's just invading their province and uh, attempting to substitute for that job that they themselves are expected to do, to consider the weight of everything, to resolve conflicts in the evidence, to evaluate the credibility of the witnesses and decide for themselves who is believable and who is not. But what we did see is a little bit more of the reasoning or maybe lack thereof, uh, behind that UK judgment, because we did get to see portions of the confidential ruling uh, that dealt with the allegations of sexual assault uh, revealed in this unsealing. And so what we saw is more of the inconsistency and the leaps of logic, stretches of, of reasoning that we have already seen in this UK judgment uh, in an effort to essentially find nobody credible, even when they have evidence to support them, if they are in conflict with Amber Heard's version of events. And the best example of this is the conflict in Judge Nichols's reasoning between why he rejected her account of Hicksville and the quote unquote uh, body cavity search, and then his reasoning for why he accepted Australia as uh, being, being truthful and uh, being, being accurate. So in the Hicksville incident, uh, Judge Nickel pointed out that Amber had claimed that she didn't realize that this would have been a sexual assault. And he found that to be lacking in credibility. And so because of that, uh, he, he found he, he could not essentially find this to be a credible account of, uh, of what had actually transpired. So he rejected the Hicksville incident and, uh, and did not find that, that that had happened. But when it came to Australia, these same facts are present. Once again, Amber Heard's explanation for why she didn't disclose this years before is that she didn't understand that this, this was a rape. And that is just simply incomprehensible. Uh, there is 
no way that you wouldn't understand that somebody violently penetrating you with a bottle that you thought might be broken and that uh, was significant enough that you had to tell, according to Amber Heard, every gynecologist you've ever had ever since, although you can't name a single one of them, that nevertheless, uh, it, it, was, it was not something that uh, registered to you as, as some type of assault. So the same reasoning is present uh, in both of these instances, and yet we see Judge Nichol uh, accepting that that really undermines her credi credibility as to Hicksville, but simply not addressing it at all when it comes to Australia. So to that extent, uh, the unsealing did show us more about the process of that UK judgment and uh, gives us a little more glimpse of uh, whether we should consider that to be a good, a fair, a just outcome uh, in light of everything that has since come to light, uh, both in the trial in Virginia and now in the unsealed documents as well. Amber argued that she wasn't allowed to present evidence uh, in the Virginia trial. Uh, she waived those therapist notes on the Dateline interview. Uh, but as I've already indicated, there was no real effort to proffer them. Uh, she hasn't put them into her record here so that independently a reviewing court is going to be able to evaluate that. So this, frankly, just looks like more of the same pattern that we have seen from Amber from the inception of her allegations of essentially arguing that evidence exists that supports her, uh, but being unwilling to actually put up that evidence when it's the appropriate time for her to do so. When it comes to the mountains of evidence that Amber and Elaine have claimed support her allegations, a review of these unsealed documents really shows more to the contrary, that it was Amber and Elaine that were trying a lot harder to keep information out of the trial than it was Johnny and his team. And some of the examples of this were that uh, Amber Heard specifically opposed Dr. Curry being able to do the same kinds of collateral interviews of independent sources that Dr. Hughes was allowed to do in her evaluation. So you, you may remember from Dr. Hughes's testimony that as part of her process, she did these independent interviews with uh, Paige Heard, Amber Heard's mother, who is now deceased, and then also Dr. Connell Cowan, her therapist. But when it came time for Dr. Curry to be able to do her own forensic evaluation, Amber Heard opposed strenuously her being able to do similar types of interviews. Now, we have to wonder why that would be if these witnesses, again, would be so favorable to Amber Heard, then why not simply allow Dr. Curry to speak to them herself? Um, it is a normal part of a forensic uh, evaluation like this. And you would expect they would, they would simply support Dr. Curry reaching the conclusion that uh, Amber and Elaine believe apparently that, that she should have reached. Uh, but no, instead the approach was to argue simply that it would be highly inappropriate in this context for Dr. Curry to do the exact same thing that was perfectly appropriate for Dr. Hughes to do in her examination. It was Elaine and Amber, of course, who opposed transparency when it came to having cameras in the courtroom. Now, this in and of itself is not particularly new information, uh, but the reasoning and the specific requests are something that we learned through the unsealing. Where we see that what Elaine wanted to do is she wanted to be able to televise the fact that Amber Heard was making accusations of sexual assault against Johnny Depp. She wanted that to be televised. But when it came to actually presenting the testimony of what she was accusing him of doing, the testimony that, quite frankly, 
led to the entire world, certainly the unanimous seven jurors, to conclude that her account simply lacked any credibility whatsoever. They didn't want that part on camera. So that, I think, goes to show who really had the interest in hiding the ball when it came to letting the public, letting the jury, letting the world see what the so-called mountains of evidence really were and who it really was that, that had that evidence. Accusations of jury misconduct. There is nothing in the unsealed documents that would substantiate that, nothing that has been followed up on, uh, no new information beyond what we already saw from Judge Azkarati's uh, order that was uh, public before the unsealing. So nothing, nothing new of substance to evaluate that particular claim of unfairness. Elaine criticized the atmosphere at the courthouse, the presence of Johnny Depp supporters, Captain Jack fans in the courtroom, packing the courtroom every day of the trial. But what we see in the unsealed documents yet again is that it was Elaine who was choosing to taint the proceedings. It was Elaine who violated the protective order that uh, held that these, per, these accusations were going to be confidential and that there is a specific process that the parties needed to be able to go through in order to present them in court. And so when the initial hearing was being held on whether the process, the trial was going to be televised or not, uh, Elaine violated that order by ignoring the provisions that established the process to, to make that disclosure. And as a result, the media became aware of that. We saw that uh, ahead, of, ahead of time as it happened when Courthouse News reported on it uh, that Amber Heard was going to be making accusations of sexual assault against Johnny Depp. So the fact that Elaine then turns around and, and argues that that same evidence needed to be somehow sealed and shielded from the cameras after she had voluntarily blabbed it out there in this pretrial hearing uh, just shows a little bit of the disingenuousness of that particular claim. So to the extent that Elaine and Amber sought in those days following the verdict to put a cloud over it, to call it into question by suggesting it was uh, somehow unfair or distorted. Uh, transparency with this unsealing has really revealed that argument uh, for the, the empty PR that it really is. And that's really the beauty of the open court system that we have in America. The fact that we, we don't need to have clouds over the process because we're able to inspect and see for ourselves and make our own decisions about what, what happened and uh, whether both parties got a fair shake uh, at being able to present their case or not. And so if there was any question, any cloud over the verdict by the suggestion that somehow these seven people who decided unanimously that Amber Heard was the abuser didn't get it right, that cloud has really been dispelled by opening up the, the process and the information that was excluded that the parties did seek to bring uh, and were not were not allowed to do, as well as to show the reasoning behind that. So this is a, a really important process because had this been done behind closed doors, had this been done by, you know, the prestige media, the elites that want to tell us what we should be thinking about this process, then we're kind of at their mercy. And that is 
the fertile ground for conspiracy theory, for misinformation, for spin to substitute for truth. So I do think it's quite telling that throughout this process, it has been Johnny Depp who has pushed for openness and transparency. And it has been Amber Heard who has sought to keep information out of the public eye, to keep the cameras out of the courtroom, to keep the materials that we have now seen uh, sealed in the court file. Because when the public is able to see for themselves and evaluate the merits of their arguments independently, what we have seen from this is that it simply reaffirms the verdict that was reached based on all of the evidence that was presented over the six weeks of trial. So if anybody was hoping for that smoking gun, that piece of information that was really going to shake the foundations, call into question the entire volume of evidence that we saw over the six weeks, and undermine the fairness of that verdict, nope, sorry, didn't get it with this unsealing. So what did we get? Well, we got certain new facts, new insights into the procedure, and we certainly got evidence that the smear merchants were able to seize on and capitalize and spin in an effort to continue to promote their preferred narrative. So we're going to take a look at what new facts did we see from these unsealed files and how that information has been spun and manipulated uh, in the reporting that we've seen by folks who prefer to tell us what they think we should think rather than to simply invite you to go and review the documents for yourself and reach your own conclusions.